Uh, my name is Daniel, I'm one of the members here of the Hackerspace, and we like to do events that draw people in. We like to do stuff for Space Week and Science Week and Engineers Week, and any other week we can do free advertising and drive people in and um, uh, advertise the space. So I'm not sure how long the space has been going for. It's about eight years, Gary. So we started in a tiny place, we moved to a, a medium sized place, and now this place is probably too big. Uh, the bigger the space, the more room for the junk. <laughs> so um, we don't get any government grants, we're just self funded. It was one of the ideas behind setting up the space, we're not reliant on the next funding round and all that sort of mess. We can give you a tour afterwards. Most events run here are free, so you can see them on the website. There's a mailing list and Twitter accounts and all that sort of stuff. Um, if you want your own key, which every member has their own key, it's usually 45 euros a month. That gives you 24 hours a day, 7 days a week access to the place. Um, if you want to come here, there's specialised nights, like every second Monday is electronics. Um, there's a craft night now, on, I think it's every second Wednesday. Um, there's lock picking, um, if you're interested in that. Um, what else have we got? Uh, anyway, there's, there's a CAD night, so if you want to do 3D printing or uh, laser cutting, and there was a CNC now. As well. So you can see all that on the website. So first up we have Connor. Uh, Connor is uh, working with little small satellites and he's going to give a talk. And then I'll give a talk on the, the projects I've been working on with the space station. And um, then hopefully Mark will be here and he can give the talk uh, on his work with NASA. So maybe a round of applause here for Connor. charge kind of wants to do. 
Um, now, we've done some pretty neat things in the meantime, um, but they have cost many, many, many billions. Um, I, I mean, I'm not sure of the exact figure off the top of my head, but the space station is in about 20 billion, and uh, the uh, Ariane 5 there on the right, which is the European rocket that they're uh, working on at the moment, uh, is going to be about 6 billion. Um, anyone got that in the pocket? I uh, don't think so. Um, so, you know, these, the space station has its uses. I'm not going to deny that at all. Uh, I've launched, well, not me personally, but um, the team that I work for uh, has launched uh, CubeSats from the space station. Basically, that right there in the middle is a box with a spring in it. And they open the box and the spring pushes up the satellite and it goes off in space and you're now a satellite independent on its own. Um, it's really box simple, it really is. Um, uh, does how many people here have heard of CubeSats before? No? Okay, so about half of it anyway. Um, but yeah, they're a lot cheaper uh, than uh, your standard uh, satellites that are the size of a truck and cost about a billion and a half to develop. Um, they're pretty small. Um, uh, they're about 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters, and in this one is a 2U, so it's by 20 centimeters on its longest point. Um, so they're a lot smaller, a lot cheaper to launch, and cost about uh, maybe 100,000 to launch one, uh, which is a lot more in the realm of a group of people with maybe a small bit of funding and an idea to go behind it. Um, so uh, what I was working on before was one of these, which was called an Argisat. So it was basically a satellite that had an Arduino running in it, and that uh, basically you could program in your Arduino IDE and uh, write your script and upload it to the satellite uh, through our radio. And you could uh, there'd be a bunch of sensors as you can see on top, such as infrared, magnetometer, acceleration. Uh, camera, there was a camera in there as well, so you could basically do what uh, if you want. If you had a satellite up there, mm, well, yeah, for about maybe 200 uh, US dollars, you can buy about an hour's worth of flight time. So uh, you can play around with that and not need to actually have to deal with uh, um, all this, <laughs> just like software service. Um, but uh, now the end result is a little more complex than this. But you can buy one of these as a kit. Um, now I'm sure a lot of you actually have Arduinos, so you probably don't need the kit. But um, uh, this was uh, basically for schools, and teachers, uh, so that they could uh, actually see for themselves firsthand of what kind of side they're dealing with. Um, but uh, yeah. Uh, so this is how it's been improving lately and basically companies are starting to realise just how cost efficient it is to actually get data down uh, using these small uh, uh, CubeSats and they send them in uh, bulk, uh, sometimes in groups of 60 and uh, it's basically uh, instead of sending one up one big uh, satellite you can send up a small one, uh, well a lot of small ones rather. Um, uh, how you get them up there? These. Uh, but um, unlike uh, the predecessors, which were government funded, these are a lot cheaper and a lot more efficient. Um, so you actually get to reuse them by landing them on a barge, like here. Uh, so basically, you can send a rocket up, and uh, as you normally do, the first stage, second stage, and separation where the satellite can go off on its own, but unlike what we've been doing up until now, the rocket can use some of its remaining fuel and basically use, its, use that as a slowdown mechanism to come back down to Earth in somewhere that is a little out of the way of things that don't like exploding things around them. Um, but uh, this is uh, significantly, this is going somewhere, to say the least. Um, this is uh, a render of the proposed rocket that is going to go to Mars in the 2020s. Um, and that's a Saturn V rocket, which is 
uh, the biggest rocket we've made so far. And uh, the stats are pretty impressive for something that's a lot cheaper. Um, but uh, this is all great and all, but why? Uh, what's that to any use? Um, well, this is a picture of uh, basically the ships around the world. And uh, after we did the whole education thing, uh, when I was working over in San Francisco, uh, we started tracking ships. Because once you're about 100 kilometers away from shore, uh, ground-based systems can't really see over the horizon. So you need a something else to do it. And there's nothing else for satellites. But uh, something like 80% of world trade goes through ships, especially in an area around here where all the Somali pirates are. Uh, so if you can't see them when you're out in the ocean, if you can't see your ships when you're out in the ocean, it's kind of hard to tell if you've been raided and whether well, where you should send a rescue team and all that. Uh, another uh, useful thing is, um, for example, China. Uh, if they're saying their GDP is like growing 50% a year, and you know where the ships are going and what's on those ships, you can start calculating yourself what are they actually exporting and what's the value of that. And it's a nice little bit of truth. Um, then the current company I'm working for, uh, we're building satellites for tracking airplanes. Um, so I don't know if uh, you remember the Malaysia Airlines plane that went down the Pacific Ocean, but the reason it went missing was there was only one satellite overhead at the time and they knew how far away the plane was when that uh, when the plane went down, but not exactly where along that line it actually was. But if you had a lot more satellites up there, uh, you could start narrowing it down by having another arc of uh, uh, another data point of triangulation. But uh, when one of these satellites costs multiple billions, they tend to only have a few up there. So we're building smaller satellites, smaller CubeSats, that uh, uh, can bridge that gap uh, while not actually increasing the cost. Um, other applications would be uh, agriculture, so you can take pictures of space, figure out what's growing, uh, and uh, how are different uh, fertilizing, fertilization rates uh, affecting the local area. Uh, and that's great information for farmers, needing to know where they need to put down more fertilizer. Saves a lot of money. Um, and then there's these guys. Uh, there's something called Made in Space, who are uh, 3D printing on the uh, space station itself, uh, so that instead of needing to send up rockets every few months to um, resupply uh, the astronauts, you can just start printing off equipment as you need it as stuff breaks, uh, which is a bit more important uh, when it comes to resource utilization. But um, and then there's um, this, of which uh, this, um, this asteroid is uh, called Rigu. Uh, there's a mission uh, planned from the European Space Agency to go to it, but um, if we're to go to space, and actually live there, um, we're going to need materials to build stuff to keep us alive. Uh, this satellite is about a kilometer in radius. Um, it's worth 95 billion in raw minerals, uh, such as lithium, uh, lithium uh, platinum, palladium, rare earth metals. And um, that's not a big one. That's a medium sized one. It's just it's got a special. Uh, it's got all the really rare stuff in it. Um, many years ago, um, the Lincoln uh, Memorial over in the U.S. was capped with aluminium because it was more expensive than gold. Uh, that was before we figured out how to extract it from the ground. It was really rare. Uh, back then fine cutlery was made from aluminium, not silver. Um, but now, there's a bunch of coke cans in the corner made of it. Um, if we can actually get a source of uh, platinum, uh, there's a lot of uses for like catalysts, um, like in our cars, that kind of stuff. So we can open up a, new, a good few new doors if we go for this stuff. Um, but um, there's a history
historical precedent for this as well. Gold rush, uh, back in California, uh, in the eighteen fourth, no eighteen fifties, um, where basically we had already, uh, well, uh, Spain had already financed Columbus and all that to find the new world, and that's what we're doing with rockets and the space station at the moment. But eventually, people started uh, realizing there was actual money to be made out there, um, and they went on their own free will to find their own riches. And at first it was just about the minerals, but over time, uh, because there was a lot of people out there, uh, people need services to get on with their lives, people need a haircut. Uh, but uh, a lot of these buildings were built uh, just from the scrap of ships that were coming ashore, uh, because a lot of these ships, people, the people that were manning these ships and sailing them to deliver the passengers, also heard about the gold rush and just abandoned the coast and uh, went to become miners. So there was no one left to sail these ships back to where they came from. So the founding of San Francisco here in the picture, is the wood from the ships were used to uh, rebuild the city around them. And now it's what, sixth largest GDP in the world, if, if California was a country. Um, so uh, to, um, yeah, uh, but wh where there's going to be people down the line, um, we're also going to need, well, stuff. Not everyone's an ast astronaut at the end of the day. Um, so that's where, this <laughs> uh, remember Hal from Space Odyssey. Uh, he was initially designed to be uh, a piece of software to help out the astronauts and went skewy and all that. But that's why we need good design and good engineering done on the ground first, so that those kind of uh, problems that you see in um, movies don't happen. But on the right there is a picture of a whiskey glass designed to work in uh, zero gravity because liquids don't tend to stick to the ground. So basically it has a coil that the water, uh, sorry, that the whiskey sticks to and has basically a, a lid here. And it's basically a sippy cup. But uh, it's a fancy sippy cup. <laughs> um, but um, when people are making like these kind of niche things, it's like when you send up regular people, not unlike astronauts, you can't be drinking from what is essentially like Capri Sun packs for the whole time. So good design is going to be needed for actually being able to live up there. And uh, there's a lot of opportunity at hand to, for the commercialization of all this. But uh, yeah. satellite that is uh, 5 centimeters by 5 centimeters by 10 centimeters and that costs about 20,000 uh, but uh, for tra tracking uh, what's now it's like tracking airplanes for example is a uh, 45 million a year endeavor so on that is it's valuable and there's a trade-off some electromagnets and we can start orientating ourselves that way but uh, there's a project uh, going to be launched pretty soon called, uh, called CAT and basically uses water as a, as a propellant uh, because it will expand massively in uh, a vacuum now it's not enough to run a rocket but for pushing a small cube it's pretty fine uh, in regards to uh, space debris god I hate you I hate this question because everyone has seen gravity <laughs> and thinks that is a massive problem. But basically, the space between uh, the Earth's, if you have a globe of uh, planet Earth, like just a model one, uh, the varnish on the surface of it 
is the uh, size of our atmosphere to scale. Um, and that's about 100 kilometers. <coughs> um, geosynchronous satellites are about 22,000 kilometers up. So when a uh, satellite breaks up in low, low Earth orbit, it's not going to get up to the geosynchronous satellites. Also, uh, the problem is when one of these big satellites explodes, they create lots of smaller pieces that break and uh, crash into other uh, satellites and creates a Kessler syndrome. Um, and that just propagates. But when it comes to smaller satellites, if you break one, it's not going to create a lot of debris. I think it's uh, the odds of hitting a CubeSat, a 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter CubeSat, is uh, 3 trillion to 1 uh, with a T. Uh, I can think of a few other things I'd rather gamble on. Um, but um, yeah, compared to the actual larger satellites that are up there at the moment, uh, uh, these CubeSats, uh, they generally re-enter into the Earth's atmosphere between six months and four years. So unlike the larger ones where there are still satellites up there from the 60s in the graveyard orbits, uh, they generally pr provide a much smaller problem than what we already do anyway. stage to space in four months. Uh, the main problems was mostly the paperwork and actually just waiting for the rocket to launch. Because uh, we had uh, a lot of these are a lot of the sub modules like the power system, uh, the uh, computer can be bought straight off the shelf from hardware providers and it's basically like assembling a PC and it's just a matter of uh, putting the software in that you want to do the application. Um, but uh, you know, uh, if you if you really get uh, your uh, work together, um, the main problem is just getting the launch contract in place rather than actually the engineering of it. Um, because like uh, if it's only about software, you can update software in flight, uh, so you can be constantly iterating and improving the satellite as the mission goes on.